We're going to talk about something that I think is, is both extremely relevant to this war that Ukraine is fighting, but is actually also of much broader relevance uh, to the world at large, because we are entering a new age of warfare, which is going to be super empowered by technology. And when you think about what the world is going to look like in the future, and you think about, for example, U.S. competition with China, U.S. military competition with China, um, inevitably it is going to take place within the, the, the confines or the atmosphere of a digital age, an age of quantum computing, an age of artificial intelligence, an age of mobile devices. And so what does all this mean and what are we learning from the war in Ukraine? Um, we literally could not have a better person to talk about this um, from the outside uh, of Ukraine, nor from the inside of Ukraine. From the outside, we have Eric Schmidt, the f founder, CEO of Google, who is probably responsible for the fastest rise of a company in market capitalization in human history. I can't remember the numbers, but uh, when Eric took Google over and when he resigned, I think there's about uh, $200 billion of market capitalization between those two dates. Um, we also have the Deputy Prime Minister, the Vice Prime Minister of, of uh, Ukraine, Mikhailo Fedorov, who is in many ways responsible for what Ukraine has been able to do in this digital space so effectively. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first start um, with Eric, and I, I, th I think, Eric, this is your first trip to Ukraine, and I want you to give us a sense of your general impressions, and then, if you will, your digital impressions, your impressions of the, what, what you have noticed about technology and war in this conflict. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Fareed. I'm not going to repeat all the praise that we heard yesterday for the heroes and leadership that we've seen here. Um, Ukraine has always had very, very good tech people, and many American firms have had divisions and so forth of programmers because of the quality of the workforce. Okay. So to me, what the most interesting thing that I've noticed is what happens when a strong technical workforce faces a difficult enemy. And that narrative is really interesting to me because I think it predicts the future for all of us. The first thing that happens in a conflict, and we all know this from military doctrine, is that there's a massive cyber attack. Um, after the massive cyber attack, of course, there's massive confusion. Uh, there were a series of steps taken very early, six months ago. One of them was to move everything to the cloud. It had been previously not okay to move to the cloud. That was to preserve digital assets in case of loss. Another thing was the decisions to put very early Starlink terminals, which would allow essentially access from a point out of the country, no matter what was happening. That decision by Elon, along with quite a few technology people who donated the money to get those Starlinks, materially changed the course of the, of the war. Um, at the same time, the citizens of Ukraine also needed a map, and so a series of crowdsourced maps, including one called Steep La Deep State Live, was erected that you could see accurately what was going on. But the key thing that they did was that the gentleman to my right had been working for years for the Estonian kind of an app that was a citizen's app. And this app, which is called DIA, um, is, uh, was started as, here's your passport, here's your digital identity. And once the war started, it was at, they added the capability to report things. And they used technology like Signal and um, Telegram, and then another new firm called Threema, which is a Swiss firm, which allow you to report things without anyone being able to track where you are. That made a lot of sense. But they made another interesting decision, which is that you have to send a picture, and they can use uh, image recognition AI to determine if this is an important picture or a not important picture. So now all you have is you have a map, you have connectivity, Everybody has an app, the app has been updated, and with the updated app, they have the ability 
to actually see what the citizens see. This allows, in my view, the first networked war. When I assess where the technology is with the tremendous leadership that you have provided, uh, which again, I cannot go on and on about, um, the remaining issue has to do with misinformation. And that'll be another tool of war, and we collectively are going to have to learn how to address that. So that's my quick, my quick report, and congratulations to you. So, Michalu, let's pick up on that, and you tell us from the inside, what were the challenges that you faced, you know, when you confronted this war, and how did you build out the system that Eric was describing? Well, first of all, the cyber war started probably yet a long time before the full-scale invasion, probably half a year before that. Uh, um, that was when uh, the massive cyber attacks had started, uh, multi-vector cyber attacks with the purpose to damage uh, to the maximum extent possible our infrastructure and to obtain an understanding of architecture of our informational systems, how they are interlinked, how they are protected, etc. So in fact, yet, yet it was in October, November, when these attacks had started, uh, we were learning how to work. We had to build this uh, defense and protection system, and actually we went through this period in quite a stable way. Uh, in addition to specific rules, uh, compliance with specific rules uh, of cyber uh, security, we also create our own red team, which was 24-7 testing our protection systems by imitating the attacks against them. <coughs> that was the way how we identified many vulnerabilities uh, in, with respect to the critical infrastructure, and thus we could prevent any further problems. Uh, of course, after that, there were some unprecedented uh, attacks against banking, sector bank institution. The next uh, step was on 16th February when the law was passed uh, on um, the cloud technologies and uh, the authorization to store the data in other countries and in the cloud. So on the day five or four of the war, when the, the data center was hit by a missile, our systems continued stable operations. Uh, everything continues working, like pensions are paid, the taxes are collected, etc. In another area, that's the area of communications, was extremely important. Uh, what we, we managed to communicate with SpaceX and Elon Musk, and we obtained this operational terminal. Actually, we had started this effort before the war, but when the invasion started, uh, there was a very quick response from Elon Musk, uh, uh, and in continuation of our previous combination, we started implementing Starlink. 20,000 of them are now operational in Ukraine. And they really help us solve many issues. Uh, we'll learn about the best cases of use of Starlinks after the victory, I'm sure. And another important area which we are developing now and where we believe the future is, is the Army of Drones project. Uh, whatever is related to the drones, uh, 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 trading of the pilots, uh, development of the hardware from, from development of digital technology. We are um, uh, proceeding to military tech and then to the drones during the war. Not just to use an efficient way what we already have, but to think ahead um, one year, half a year, uh, making sure that we are the most developed country in the world with this respect. Uh, and probably one more challenge is that we need to launch a lot of services for the people because people are moving very quickly. They have damaged their properties, and that's what we have this DIA for, so that you can launch 
Uh, uh, very quickly, any kind of service that can be rendered uh, to the citizens. Um, so as of today, we have T-Army, uh, Army of Drones project. We continue launching our services. Our critical infrastructure is still stable and operational, and we continue investing into it. So since you have brought up the, the, the topic of an army of drones, um, I want to give you guys, give everybody one example of what it means to have drones, but particularly when you have this great advantage that Ukraine has, which is the participation of the whole of Ukrainian society. And when I say the whole of Ukrainian society, I mean every man, woman, and, and young man. Uh, so I'm going to ask this young man, um, Andrei Pokrasa, to tell us his story of how he helped the Ukrainian army uh, fight the war. And his father, Stas, is sitting next to him, so if you decide, if the... If, if the Father decides he wants to add a few words, that's fine, but uh, Andre, why don't you tell us where you were and what happened with, with your drone? Well, I'd like to say that on 24th of February, the the full-scale aggression started, and we were at home. And we certainly did not expect uh, that we will be honored to, to help the armed forces. Uh, uh, it, we couldn't really get back to normal. Uh, we were shocked, but 28th of February, we offered our assistance to local territorial defense and armed forces of Ukraine. We had an um, electro car and a drone. Uh, uh, we were contacted by the local territorial defense units. At that point of time, they couldn't find a pilot for their drone. That pilot couldn't um, get uh, to the place because of the occupation. And we were suggested uh, certain work uh, to monitor military equipment movement in Kyiv Oblast uh, with the help of small sized drones. And uh, uh, during that time, and while we were doing that, uh, it was very cold, so the drones would uh, uh, need uh, recharging very often. Unfortunately, we lost one, but still, we I managed to make sure that the military equipment was done, removed and pushed out of Kyiv Oblast, so everything was successful. Uh, let me ask, uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, let me ask uh, Yuri Kastyanov, uh, who was an officer in the armed forces of Ukraine, to, to tell from his point of view how important was this, uh, this assistance that Andre gave and how many armored units, Russian armored units, were destroyed because of this young man's drone. Yes, good morning. Indeed, every word that Andre told that is truth and nothing but truth. I was there. We worked together thanks to this boy, thanks to his father, and uh, other villagers who lived with them, they could watch this equipment move. They were moving uh, in a very nasty way with the banners raised up. Uh, and we managed to destroy about 100 pieces of equipment, at least 100 of their soldiers, I mean, 
The enemy was stopped in Berezovka and they couldn't move any further. So thank my thanks to everybody who helps. I think our Western partners need to learn our experience of use of UAVs during the war because probably that's unique experiences of now and probably that will be helpful to everybody. Uh, you know, it, it, it might be worth uh, pointing out how the world is watching the acts of people like um, Andre. I spoke to the foreign minister of Taiwan a, a, a few, maybe a month or two ago, and I asked him what is the lesson he draws from the war in Ukraine? What geopolitical lessons and how he looks at the b balance of power? And he said the main lesson we draw from Ukraine is that if you are willing to fight for your country, America will support you and the world will support you. And what we have learned from Ukraine is that it's not just the government that is fighting for its country, but the people of Ukraine are fighting for their country. And we have to make sure that we, the Taiwanese people, have a similar spirit of self-defense. So I think in a very real way, what you are doing has global consequences. Uh, so thank you, Andre. I, I wanted, uh, Eric, do you want to yeah, so comment? I, I take the mic. Yeah. Thank you. So um, the, the traditional doctrine in, in the military is basically the military fights the battle. And the history of the internet is that the internet in, with Paul Barron's invention of packet switching in 1964 and then the early funding of the internet in the late 1960s, it was designed precisely for these reasons. It was designed to be robust against centralized attack. And that was an ethos, it was a political ethos from citizens who did not trust their government because of Vietnam and other things. So now, 60 years later, what you're seeing is that if you have a citizenry that agrees to use the tools, the citizenry is an enormous amplification. Now think about wars 50 or 60 years ago. The citizens would have been the victims because there was nothing that they could do. But now they have, because of the internet, a lot to do. And the first thing that they can do is they can watch and observe. And in military doctrine, the most important thing to do is to have intelligence. So the combination of technologies today, which we're seeing out here, are not just the drones, but also commercial satellites. So Ukraine, for example, recently did a deal with a private company to get more continuous uh, commercial satellite images. And I'm sure they have military options as well that I'm not aware of. So remember, if you're a military leader, the most important thing you need is eyes. And now you went from having three eyes to having essentially the entire citizenry of the country helping you. That is a massive doctrinal shift. And it's important to say that that plus the drones completely changes the nature of how you plan. The, the militaries that I have worked with have all anticipated this, but they're not doing it. The difference is that Ukraine is doing it, and that's why it's so interesting. Let me ask you, Eric, does that mean that the digitization of warfare, does it provide a structural advantage to the little guy, to the, you know, to the, to the resistor, to the citizen versus the army, or can, can the Russians, for example, use the, the digital warfare to their advantage? Well, these tools are available to any, any country that wishes to use them and is willing to invest in them. It's easy for Ukraine because they have such a strong population in this area. Um, in, in the American doctrine, we moved from non-precision to precision warfare in, in what was called the third offset. This was, you know, 10 years ago. And the basic idea was to decrease collateral damage. And the idea was that if you have to have a war which is bad, you need to target very accurately because most of the casualties in war were actually the non-combatants. So that was an improvement, if you will, in doctrine. This next improvement, in my view, is as profound because it says that the war is largely about information and how you manage your resources as opposed to the particular bombs. That does favor the more networked and the more agile. So you can have a situation where a very large power struggles against a much smaller power who is more agile. 
Now, <clears throat> if you think about it, if there's enough of an overmatch, now we don't know what that percentage is, but eventually the overmatch at, at huge cost can probably win. But thank God, societies are not willing to take that penalty. But let me ask you one further question. When you look at Russia and Russian strategy and tactics in this war, um, you know, we were often told that Putin had been building up his, de his defense forces over the last 10 years with all this oil money. We were told Russians were pretty good at, at, at science. Um, I'm struck by the, 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 the crudeness of the Russian strategy. Uh, is that how it appears to you, and, what, and do you have any thoughts on it? Well, uh, I'm not an, obviously an expert on that. Um, it seems to me that the Ukraine society is very entrepreneurial, and the likelihood of a general in Ukraine getting exactly what he wants from his colonels and from their is very low, right? That the likelihood is that the people are autonomous in their action. That autonomy is consistent with the freedom that digital technology gives you. If you have a, a hierarchical command structure, which is inflexible, which America had basically um, until Vietnam, right? The, the, the American military doctrine, I, the reason I know all this is that I worked as the head of the innovation board for the U.S. Defense Department for five years, so I've learned all of this, that about 40 or 50 years ago, under General um, Colin Powell and others, they moved to a much, much more flexible command structure. So we have many Ukrainian military leaders here. My guess is that they're the same, that their notion of these small strike teams and moving quickly is perfectly adapted to the doctrine of what the technology and the drones allows. So as much as I love technology and we love what you have done, it's really the total system of flexibility, of leadership, of information, and moving quickly, agile networked war. That's likely the winning strategy for any power that's not using um, things like nuclear weapons. Mikhailo, let me ask you this question about Russia. What are you noticing about what the Russians are doing? Um, what are you trying to do to counter it? Uh, when you watch the Russians, are they using the digital space in an intelligent way? Well, first of all, if we are talking about the drones and the physical battlefield, uh, we should not underestimate Russians. They have this Orlan UAVs, thousands of them. They uh, um, actually worked on them for decades. They still have this mass production and supplies uh, of these UAVs. Uh, they use them very uh, efficiently in the warfare plus uh, uh, they can prevent some of our UAVs from doing their job. What is important here, as Eric said, our army and our militaries, they are agile. They can see the target very quickly. And they can make a decision very quickly. They adapt uh, technologies to their uh, urgent needs, and they are quick decision uh, makers. Our uh, army is looking more and more as an IT company, agile company, while the Russian army is a vertical hierarchy based on command chain. Everything is prescribed on paper in a very rigid manner. So in the modern battlefield, it's very difficult to use technologies when you have this kind of organizational structure and approach. So um, trying to be agile, we have some successes. I'll share with you an interesting case. Uh, just recently I visited the front line and we had a meeting with the leader of a strategic uh, task force and when I asked him how can we help you, he said please bring us a 3D printer. I was kind of lost. I I realized then I understood what they wanted to uh, have these small drones um, uh, 
another drone so they wanted they were to film the uh, pictures of mother nature but then they installed over there the launching system to drop the bombs so uh, adaptation of technology by digital friendly population this um, uh, entrepreneurship spirit which uh, allows our public to start producing very quickly i don't know what russians were thinking about when invading the territory but i know what our entrepreneurs can do now with the drones and with their productions uh, but i can hardly imagine what they will do in uh, five or six months because they will have to run away from these huge, huge crowds of drones attacking them from everywhere. So yes, Russia does have the technical opportunities, but the structure and culture of management prevents them from doing, from being agile. I think corruption plays an important role in that because now when we uh, dismantle some of the drones and communication devices we find inside uh, many very interesting Chinese uh, chips uh, which are packed in a plastic uh, spoon box, something like that. Thank you. Let me ask if I may, uh, President Levitt of, of, uh, of Latvia is here, and I wonder if I may ask you, um, you could confront something like this, a very, very powerful country that tries to attack you. And you, you are also extraordinarily advanced in the digital space. How do you think of this problem of getting the citizens to fight a war, not just the army? Yeah, I, I think uh, this is a very important point because uh, digital knowledge in our society is very widespread. I think uh, the most or all uh, 15 to 30 year old people are very advanced uh, in, in uh, the digital technologies. And of course, uh, we have also strong institutions uh, which are preserving our, uh, our critical infrastructure. But uh, if, uh, if uh, there uh, would, be, would be a real actual need, I am absolutely sure that uh, we would have uh, many, many thousands or ten thousands of people which uh, on a voluntary basis uh, will uh, give a very important uh, impact to this uh, cyber struggle. So I think as a digitally very advanced society, uh, we are also looking to Ukraine's experience, and uh, it is very inspiring for the whole uh, uh, so new digital society. Eric, you, you talked about um, the, uh, the, the area where Russia has been able to use digital technology, ironically, is not in building something, but in spreading disinformation. That is something they have done, uh, and pretty effectively. Talk a little bit about that. The problem, obviously, is one not just confined to Russia. We have it in the United States. How should we think about this problem and what to do? Well, <clears throat> I think it's uh, well understood in doctrine that war is also a political act, and therefore it is a communications act. And uh, if you were an evil person trying to start a war, the first thing you would do is try to shut down the enemy's communications, and the second thing you, you would like to replace it by your own. Historically, that's when people would take take down the television station, you know, of, of my generation. So the equivalent of that television station today is the internet, and uh, because of Compromat in in Russia, they have a long history of doing this using traditional techniques. The First and most important thing when you find yourself in this situation is to actually have a very strong notion of digital identity so that you know you're actually dealing with someone. So for example, with the Dia app, if you actually falsely record something, it knows the phone and it knows roughly who the phone is registered to. And so it can decide that this person is a, is a likely agent, in other words, not a truth teller. So you have to, in the system, accept 
that you will have bad actors and make them make it secure. And that's one of the things that the Ukraine government did very well. The next thing which is coming is that it's going to be very, very easy to generate propaganda that's false and spread it very widely. And the way this will happen is through what is called generative design, where AI systems will be able to truly manufacture false stories and false videos which are targeted at the operation. And because of the way social media works, the social media companies will take it and take it as given and amplify it. This is a threat to all democracies, not just in Ukraine. But that's the next challenge. So once you accept that you're in a networked war space, you have to have a strong notion of identity, and you have to have some way of dealing with misinformation to deprioritize it or mark it. One of the things that I learned a long time ago is that even if you show someone something that's false and you say it's false, they still believe that it's true. So the suppression of misinformation, especially visual information, is going to be crucial in all networked war. Let me ask, we again have some extraordinary expertise in the house. So I'm going to ask if I can get a mic to Radek Sikorski, who was both foreign minister and defense minister of Poland, uh, to talk about this issue of disinformation of Russia's tactics and his thoughts about what one can do about it, um, you know, how to, how to think about it and how to react to it. Um, if we can get a mic, um, otherwise I'll just hand mine, mine over. My, uh, I think um, somebody disappeared with the mic, so Svetlana, just use the mic. We, I don't know. There he is. Hello. <clears throat> well, in Poland we have uh, the problem that because of hundreds of years of Polish-Russian uh, rivalry and um, and Russian domination over Poland, people tend to think that we are immune from Russian disinformation, and this is not true. Um, because I think, as Eric says, um, it, it works subliminally. Um, the Russians, unlike the Soviets, don't want you to like Russia. They know that Putinism and Russian nationalism uh, are not good export commodities. What they want you to do is to disbelieve your own authorities and um, to regard our system as, as bad as theirs. In other words, to demotivate us and to sow confusion and promote extremism. And at that, I'm afraid they've been quite successful hitherto. Uh, over the war with Ukraine, I think we're winning. Um, you know, I, I was one of the people in the European Parliament who's been advocating for shutting down Sputnik and uh, Russia today for years because we couldn't affect their information space. They were spreading their lies and many Europeans and Americans didn't understand that RT was Russia today. They thought it was just another you know, Fox-like uh, TV station. Uh, I think Ukraine has won in the, uh, the information war in the West. It's the third world that now needs, um, we need to pay attention to. You know, it's fascinating you talk about that Russian strategy because I remember Steve Bannon saying that his strategy was not to try to combat everything that he disliked about what people were saying, but as he put it, flood the zone with shit so that nobody believes anything anymore. And that that's really the, uh, you know, at some level, the, the kind of highest level of destructive disinformation which then creates a kind of sense that who knows what's true? Who knows what, you know, what any, whether anyone is saying anything that's true? So this issue, I think, is the fundamental future question. It's going to be possible to flood the zone with misinformation in order to destabilize the trust of the government. And because all networked wars depend on the trust of their citizens at some basic level, you're going to have to have some way. Now, notice that President Zelensky does a television show every night. And that's his way to talk directly to the citizens of Ukraine. What if there's a situation where the president, like in the United States, is claimed to be illegitimate? And people say that this is not our legitimate president, and, it, and we won't follow him or her. 
because they were not elected properly or there was some profound issue, you could see that it could materially affect the motivation of people to serve their country and so forth. So the trust in a, in a crunch, the trust of the country and the national identity is very important. If you follow that, that means that countries that have strong national identities, a strong notion of who they are and a strong leader co in combination with a strong networked war are likely to do best. So, Michaelo, what are you going to do about this? Um, is there, you know, is there a, do you have a sense of a way to make good information win against bad information? Um, is there, is, is it a, something that can be done using digital technology or does one have to just be smart and counter in the way that President Zelensky is with, that, with those nightly shows? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's uh, actually this is quite a systemic type of work along all lines. Uh, you need to understand the sources of disinformation, the platform used to distribute it, and you have to purposely work in a targeted way to deal with it. Like we have communication with the Facebook to fight botnets, we have communication with Twitter, with other platforms. You may remember a quick fast-paced traction by Meta when they quickly tapped on quite a number of sources they identified as funded by the Russian government. Such and similar communications allowed getting rid of uh, unauthorized bots across the social media. This is one of the methods. It is also very important to spread the news from official data sources like the Ukrainian National Security and Defense Council and have lots of information to tell truth from the lies. We have uh, you know, like groups of professionals who have united to tell the truth and prevent disinformation from penetrating the media. It's also about the quality work of our journalists, online journalists who are regularly posting analytical details, providing information uh, with reviews of world media reactions. It is also about facilitating access of the world media into Ukraine. Sometimes to spread, to, to be the disinformation, you simply have to allow true information to come when those videos and real stories become circulated worldwide across the media outlets, and this is not possible to spread this true information if this is done correctly. And surely there should be counteractions, countermeasures to fight the invaders uh, also inside the occupying country, but this is uh, probably a topic for uh, after, until after the victory. The, um, <clears throat> one of the problems that you get into is you get into a situation where um, people are not fully trusting their government and someone that they don't know says, do you know, they're not telling you the truth. So an example would be, let's say the government announces that they've made progress in a particular part of the country. And one individual says, did you know this government, which they don't like or for whatever reason, is, is actually not telling you the truth. It's worse than you think. Humans tend to be skeptical. And such a person can get, uh, using clever techniques, can actually get quite an audience. Now this problem is solved in China because they censor the internet. And this problem is solved in Russia because they censor the internet. This problem is not solved in democracies, because democracies are organized around individuals having freedom of speech. We have to come up with a way of expressing limitations on speech, which provide freedom of speech, but without lying that causes people to get killed. And we haven't found that boundary. Now, in the case of the tech industry, um, as the minister said, what happened was, because of the war, the tech companies started taking down these bots that were organized to uh, spread misinformation. Now, why do they exist? Because someone, it's very easy to sow disaffection instead of falsehoods. In other words, as long as everyone is corrupt, you lose, and this is how 
voter participation gets lower. So I think it's important to have some rules about these bots. My, my favorite example is this week as I was coming here, there was a big article that Amazon had had to shut down reviews on movies before the movies were released. And the reason is that the bots would write the reviews ahead, the bots, that is not computer, humans would write the reviews ahead of the movie release and basically tank the movie before anyone had solved it. Now, why in the world do people do this? <laughs> right, these are just movies, this is not a war. And yet they do, right? So it's illustrative of the core problem for humans. This is a US problem, it's not relevant to Ukraine, but you get my point. So the misinformation issue is basically a situation where people are distrustful and someone wants to cause some kind of harm or disaffection and they work together in an open digital system. It is an unsolved problem. Ukraine has solved this to some degree because you're in an actual war and you're not going to put up with it. But many countries in Europe in particular are facing this now. Eric, um, we, we have a little bit of time and I didn't want to, since we have you, I wanted you to paint a picture um, of the future of war, thinking about artificial intelligence in general, because this is something you've written a book on with Henry Kissinger. Um, what, how different is, is, is the use of AI, what, what does the use of AI do to warfare? And you know, what's, is, there, is this a game changer? So um, Dr. Kissinger and I and Dan Huttenlocker wrote a book called The Age of AI, which was really about how AI was gonna change society. And we believe, uh, Dr. Kissinger believes that AI is, is a fundamental changer in human history because humans have never had an intelligence that's not human to contend with. In other words, we've never had a peer intelligence that's as smart as we, but different. And we talk a lot about that in the book. With respect to artificial intelligence, um, it's gone through a series of waves. Today, it's much better than human vision it's much better than human analysis. It can compute functions that humans can't and computers can't without AI. And it's making progress for a large language and will at some point reflect more general intelligence. It's coming very quickly. In the military context, I think there are three areas. The first one is the, this obvious one around the use of AI in war in targeting. So an example would be that you can build a, a piece of artillery that with a camera, can target a specific individual using essentially video vision recognition. That is a consistent change with respect to more accurate targeting, the so-called precision bombing. The second one, which I worry a lot about, is the construction of databases of biology. Uh, what's happening is that as we learn more about how human biology and natural biology works, the ability to combine all of those into viruses that can harm people is likely to get very, very good. And we're, we, we are calling for regulation in that area to make sure that these databases do not fall into the wrong hands. And the third one that we identify is this issue around changing the information battle. That it's going to become so easy to confuse people because the technology is gonna get so good that you're going to have to have some, some solutions there. Now in the US, and of course I worked with the military there, a, the, the US military uses AI for, for example, drone footage. We haven't talked about that here, but the US doctrine of essentially uh, pattern of life drones um, and humans looking at that is being replaced by computers that are doing the same watching. So that's a straightforward efficiency improvement. The real strategic value of AI will be its ability to predict patterns. So you can imagine that at some point, if, if this hor horrific war continues, it will be possible for you using tools to predict what's going to happen next. And if I'm a field commander, the ability to predict what's going to happen next is, is gold. Fascinating. Um, before we close, I know that uh, Victor Pinchuk wanted to make a personal intervention uh, with regard to some of this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, we all know about Eric Schmidt, that he is uh, CEO of Google and chairman of Google, and he's one of the biggest and most successful American entrepreneurs. But uh, by the way, he's, I think, 
uh, first American big businessman who visited uh, Ukraine, things were started. And thank you very much for this. But I want to say, to tell you one story about Eric, which probably white audience doesn't know. Uh, I think it was 24th or 25th of February, first hours, first hours of war, and office of Eric contacted my office, and they uh, suggested that, look, this is Eric's idea. Let's found Ukraine Relief Fund, and Eric is ready to donate immediately two million US dollars just for humanitarian aid for Ukrainian people, for Ukrainian soldiers. It was, it was his initiative. And of, of course, it was very important. And we founded this Ukraine Relief Fund. Later, some other very successful, well-known American businessmen joined join us. But it was very important in the first hours of the war to have this donation. Probably it was one of the first, if not a first example of this donation from Western business world for this humanitarian project. It was vitally important, definitely saved some lives of Ukrainian heroes. Thank you very much, Eric. And with that, I think we are uh, concluded. Minister uh, Fedorov, thank you so much, Eric Schmidt. And of course, thanks to our uh, young, young uh, Andre Pokrasa. Thank you for all your work and keep, uh, keep up the good work.